Roberta, th you know, thank you for taking the time to meet with us. Uh, Roberta Amundsen is a, uh, a patron of the arts, a journalist, a writer, and uh, we wanted to uh, talk with you about uh, for the Free City Center, which is uh, Pacific Research Institute's effort to promote better cities. So uh, here, here, yeah, yeah. So and not just dump on cities because a lot yeah. of a lot of people on the right of center that I you know I consider myself a right of center, but a lot of people just dump on how bad San Francisco is. I love San Francisco. I want it to be a better place. I want small cities to be a better place. So the goal is to come up with reform ideas. Right. So anyway, my interest in interviewing you came when I was, uh, we were doing a video with Jim Palmer, a mutual friend at yeah. the Orange County Rescue Mission. And yeah. we were talking about ways to address the homelessness uh, crisis, which is a problem for, for yeah. urban areas. So it's a problem in small towns too, but it's a, it's a big problem in urban areas. And he had mentioned that you had uh, focused and written about the importance of beauty and the context that we were discussing it was uh, a homeless facility and and uh, I, as I remember it, uh, the importance of having artwork and a lovely building and having a place yeah. that when the homeless people are there, they don't just feel like they're being warehoused. So, so I wanted to ask you about that. Why do you think beauty matters in, in the provision of services for people who are who are at the you know or having having trouble who are homeless? Why does beauty matter in that context? I come at it from a Christian point of view, but you don't have to be a Christian or a believer of any kind. I think to to understand um, from from a Christian point of view, human beings are created in the image of God, and and therefore they are they are looking for uh, they're created to create and and to um, to to um, they're created frankly to make beautiful things and we're created to want something more and but if you take it from a purely like a materialist or atheist point of view um, a human being has to have something that inspires them to go forward and and beauty has that effect and, and it also is a message you walk into a place that looks like a barracks and you are housed in a place, crammed together, jammed together, the place is ugly. Um, it says, you're not worth very much. You go into a place that somebody has taken the care to make it hospitable to you, to live in, um, and, and it's, has made the spaces comfortable. Not luxurious necessarily, but comfortable, and it's cared about the color that is used in the walls and the structure of the place. It says somebody thought you mattered enough to take the care to do this to the place that you're coming to, and that means that your life is worth something. There are people who think your life is worth something, even though at the moment maybe you don't. And and so you when you warehouse people. They be, what do you keep in warehouses? Stuff that you don't want, stuff that you eventually end up getting rid of usually, unless you're Amazon and you're selling it, but that's a different right. kind of warehouse. It's the cast off things. And so it says you're the cast off people. But if, you, if care has been taken in the place, and the Village of Hope is a great example. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jim, Jim did it intuitively. Jim Palmer at right. the Village of Hope. Um, he did it intuitively. They start the first one they did was the House of Hope, which was for abused women and children, which at the time was, if not the first, one of the first um, refuges for abused women where they could bring their children, which was crucial. It's like 35 years ago they did or something like that. At any rate, they they just intuitively um, decorated the space with it was old furniture but good and they made sure that the place had a homey feel so when those women and their children who were fleeing, mm -hmm. um, it came in and didn't say, you're nothing because you've had this experience. It said, no, you're something and you're of value. And Jim just intuitively understood that. And when he came to the Village of Hope, he had the same idea in mind. So they had a designer design, they had a, a local artist 
paint the child care center. I don't know if you've been there, but it's delightful. Mm -hmm. With all this, you know, they had a, a boat, and one room is decorated with, painted with different, um, um, different kinds of jobs you could go and do, like a fireman and a chef, and and there are paintings on. Them. I mean, it's just delightful. One room is made like you're in the woods for the little kids, and they also have a petting zoo outside, oh. so the kids have contact with animals. The little kids. And it, you know, there's been a lot of research about how, how that has an efficacious effect on kids. And then the rest, and the, when they opened the Village of Hope, um, interior designers from Orange County gave their time to decorate the rooms. That's since gone through, because it's now been, what's well, it been, 15 years, it's gone through iterations. But nevertheless, they still care that the rooms um, are welcoming. And so when you go into the Village of and then we commissioned stained glass windows for their chapel and also a, a large um, ceramic vase in the yard with a water feature that I'm told and I've seen pictures of. People like to sit around and talk. Sometimes they sit around and pray. Um, but it's like this calming and also lovely thing right. in the middle. And it impacts how people behave too, yeah. right? When you have beautiful things and just like when yeah. you're in school and you've dressed nice, you behave better. You behave better. <laughs> and so people like, yeah, I'm here to I'm here to I'm here to go somewhere from where I've been. Yeah. And and it's possible. Yeah. Well on that on that issue of, you know, beauty like I find that I love architecture. So to me it's really important um, that the homes we live in or places uh, we are. I, I just like it. I, I don't know. I like various types of it, but it hits a deep chord. It, it matters to me. I know people who, uh, and I'm Eastern Orthodox, so we go to churches where yeah. icons are important. But I know people who, it just doesn't do anything for them. I mean, they, they, it, it doesn't matter to them, uh, uh, you know, what kind of uh, uh, aesthetic surroundings. And I'm wondering, how do we, I don't know, you've thought about it deeply. Why do people respond to to these sorts of things differently, you know. Sometimes people don't know what they don't know, um, and so people who say it doesn't matter, I, I question. They maybe haven't thought about it, haven't realized it. I think it does matter. Um, I know the experience when we did our office. I mean, most offices are beige or gray, okay. um, and I. I wasn't going to do that. And you've been here, you can see right now there's an orange wall behind us. And it, it was just really important to me to create a space that had energy and life to it and, and, and said, this is, this is what, what happens here is important and you're an important part of it. And it matters that you're in a space that reflects who we are and what we do. I mean, I'm involved in the arts, so I'm going to work out of a beige basement. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a contradiction in terms and the ki other kinds of things we do. And we had people who, I heard the scuttlebutt, who when they heard that I was going to use the primary colors throughout the building, were kind of wondering what, the, you know, what that would be like. And then a woman who um, was here at the time it happened who was more skeptical um, later said to me, I was driving down the road and I looked in an office and it was all beige and I thought, oh, they need some color in there. And then she said, and then I realized how much I appreciated it and what a difference it made to me to go to work and uplifting it is and I feel like I'm in a, a space that, that somebody cared about me in a way that they didn't have to care about me and they value my work and my contribution. So it has an effect. Right. You know, and it's like during COVID, we live at the beach, we're very fortunate, and people lined up to watch the sunset. Mm -hmm. Every night the street was just lined. One night there were people with a camper van, they were sitting on top. They were there for like a week was going. Why? <laughs> Well, we're in lockdown. Nobody knows what the heck is going to happen next. And, but the sunset's still beautiful. Right, it's very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, it, right. Uh, now, uh, Free Cities is all about promoting better cities. 
And, you know, a lot of places and cities are, you know, unattractive. And, and I was wondering whether you've thought much about the idea of what we can do, uh, and I'm not looking for this, this specific a policies, program. a program, yeah. I'm just generally One, speaking, philosophically, uh, what we can do to make uh, all uh, cities of all type, you know, whether it's a, a city like Irvine, which is a newer suburban type city, or an uh, older city like San Francisco, how can we make them more beautiful? Well, it, make, it makes me think a couple of things come to my mind. One is not to mention someone who's become more controversial than he was, was when, when Rudy Giuliani became mayor of New York, which even my very democratic friends um, are thankful for what he did then. They subsequently think he should like move somewhere else. But at any rate, that's neither here nor there. What he he what he did it was it was the it was the which Wilson is it was it James Q. Wilson who wrote about broken windows. I believe it was. And yeah. um, and it, the first thing you did is you repair the windows. Mm. And those kinds of they seem like cosmetic things, which they did in New York. You repaired the broken windows. You cleaned up the city. Just starting there makes a difference. It's one of the complaints about San Francisco now. The lack of public order. That it's the lack of public order, and that makes people feel safe and comfortable. If it's just broken windows make you think, okay, who did that? Right. Where am I? Is it safe to walk down this street? Um, but if they're fixed, they don't. So just on those very you know, mundane kinds of things and keeping the streets clean, et cetera. That matters, just for starters. I mean, you don't need to be Laguna Beach where everybody votes on what the, your storefront looks like. Right. But on the other hand, do encourage people to think about that, mm -hmm. to think about their public face. And it, my husband's father, he subsequently got an award for this. I mean, he'd been dead for 30 years and was given by the Architecture Association of Orange County. But his uh, savings and loan buildings were designed by an artist. And he thought that the look of the building contributed to the neighborhood. And it also was good advertising, which he cared about. And now a lot of those buildings have been protected. Yeah, the, the mosaics out front, which I, I mosaics, love Mosaics out front, uh, out front um, uh, sculptures and inside there might be murals or whatever and those buildings are you know protected and he didn't have to do that but he, he thought that those buildings were a part of a public environment and a public face and well he didn't exactly lose money on the proposition I, I just want to get to how fixing up a building how does that impact the urban environment and, and um... well you know, it's sort of, it's, it's the broken windows on steroids. Um, because it said the building mattered, it says the town matters. And it makes people proud. And they want people to see it, and then they think, well, maybe I ought to paint my house. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I ought to, you know, fix that roof, or maybe I ought to, you know? And, and they're little things. And, and, you know, it doesn't have to be like Better Homes and Gardens magazine comes in and fixes it up. But you paint your house, it makes a difference. Right. Just and that kind of little thing, and the library, and then the town starts, people will kind of want to be there, so there's more life in the town. And we also renovated the Carnegie Library oh. in town, and it's a building perfect. on the corner, and we, I was a little carried away. Um, but I know that to this day, it has affected the town. I still hear about it, and they even put up a, I mean, they get, had a sculpture designed in my honor. Oh, nice. Yeah, which, you know, is nice. But iconic buildings, I feel like people uh, feel a certain ownership yeah. of them, you know. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, in a town where I spend a lot of the year, they knock down this beautiful old church to put up a, a hideous uh, commercial building. And I was angry about it. I mean, I, I'm a believer in property rights, but I still, I felt, you know, I, I you know, I felt offended by it, violated, and I think when you f the reverse is true, you fix up a, a hotel, yeah. people feel ownership. Well, and the private, you know, the library was a, it, it, it belonged to the city. Yeah. And the city didn't have the money to fix it, and they didn't know what to do. 
and yet fixing that building, it's in the center of the town. You've been to Perry. I mean, Perry is unique because it had, didn't have a town square, it had a town triangle. It tells you everything about the town. It's a little yeah. off. Anyway, it's a good town. It's a railroad town. And I come from a railroad family. But fix, that building is smack dab in the center of the town. And it, it's fixed up. Yeah. And, and they're, all, they're proud of it. Of course they are. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's important. Well, I was reading a, a King's College uh, publication had an interview with you. Oh, and a, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah and, and, and you said, I'm just quoting, you said, beauty is not a thing. The beautiful is a thing. Whatever beauty is, it is not perfection, at least not in this world. Could you explain what you mean by that? Well, you know, well it sort of goes to the arts and crafts tradition where they said everything should have a flaw. And the, in the arts and crafts tradition, meaning William Morris and William right. Burne Jones and those people, the, the British arts and crafts tradition, um, not making macrame hangings. Right. Anyway, yeah. um, they, everything, and Ruskin said it, it should have a flaw. It's why he thought Venice was perfect, because it had flaws. And it's why they were critical of the Greeks, who everything had to be symmetrical. Because it's, and it's also like that children's book, The Velveteen Rabbit, The More You Are, the more fur you have rubbed off, the more you are real. So when we try to make things perfect, we make them um, unapproachable, uncomfortable, if you will. Un, you know, because we know we're not perfect. And yet things can be beautiful, but they have nooks and crannies. They're interesting. They have, they, they have life to them. And, and so that's, that's what I meant by that. Um, it comes out of the arts and crafts tradition, and that we, they're not, they don't suffer from hubris or pride. Beautiful things are, are they are what they are, um, but they aren't objects of worship. They're objects, they, the beautiful, um, the beautiful makes you want to be beautiful and makes you want to be in it. Right, despite, despite our flaws. Yeah, yeah. despite our flaws. To, participate in it and, um, and, and and to know that you're not perfect but you can be beautiful and it's not the same thing. I, I really like that in fact a couple things that uh, point points I want to make re related to that is um, uh, well, your husband Howard Amundsen uh, did wonderful work fighting against uh, uh, eminent domain abuse. Yeah. I, I wrote a book, book about it back in 04 and about eminent domain abuse and redevelopment agencies, yeah. which fortunately finally went away yes. in 2012. Yes. Uh, but my sense was, and what it relates to the point you made, is, is these government planners, they insisted, they wanted everything to be perfect. They didn't see beauty in the individual, the guy who put his whole life into a, a little business in a strip mall or a downtown shop, they didn't see beauty no. in that. They wanted to level it, which they often did, um, using the government's power of eminent domain, and then they put up these buildings that were mostly cookie cutter, and and I found often those buildings were less beautiful than what was there oh. before. And I, maybe you can uh, you can address that point of beauty versus like the Robert Moses view uh, versus the Jane Jacobs view. Yeah. And I think we're all in the Jane Jacobs. Yeah, view. it's it's back to what the it's back to Ruskin and Morris's critique of the Greeks. Um, Handmade things look handmade. They're beautiful, but you know, it's even on a perfectly stitched per Persian rug, there will be a stitch off. Mm -hmm. And it is that that gives it texture and life and beauty. And I'm thinking of the book by Christopher Alexander, the, A Pattern Language. It's about the human scale. And that's something that Jane Jacobs was very big on. And, and about the creation of, of neighborhood and and it's individuality, it's difference. It's one of the reasons offices are all beige is because, well, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. Well, no, and the, like in this office, it's not all the same. And that makes it interesting. And our, our architect who designed our house, who works in broadly the arts and crafts tradition, um, made it so that no matter where you stand in the house, you look in, just, you look, it leads your eye on to the next room around the corner. Mm. And he calls that an architecture of hope because it leads you forward. And so this, the city street where you, I love, I, we live in Corona Del Mar, 
which doesn't have a homeowners association. Yay. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. Because the houses are all different architectural styles. Except some of the new ones, but you can see which phase some of the new ones were built in. And even when they're all building, you know, faux Italian, there's somebody who built something else because they want it. And it's much more fun. It's a lot Variety of fun. is fun. And we like flower gardens. We don't want just one kind of flower in the flower garden. It's because we want to see the variety and the richness and the texture. Yeah. And that's beauty is the kind of thing that leads you on. The beautiful is 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 that which leads you out of yourself and into the world in a way that you embrace the world and and want to participate in a way that that makes it better. I mean, I remember Jane Jacobs uh, uh, quoting people who had uh, lived in a uh, public housing project that was demolished and they put up a, Pruitt Igo. Uh, yeah, and they the and, famous one. And she quoted them, and they're saying things like, "Yeah, but now I have no place to get a cup of coffee, and I don't know anybody." And that, you know, that I think is, is part of yeah. beauty, the beauty of human connections. And well, and another example is the, the um, Center for oh, was it? Inner City Christian Federation in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, has, had, oh, 15 years ago, they had built, renovated or built more than 500 low-income housing units. And um, one of their principles was beauty. And the point being that a lot of the housing that had been built by HUD um, um, backed onto the street. No porches, no nothing. They put in cheap windows. The windows half the time didn't work, and you could tell. And they were, it was, they were fortress-like. And they turned into, you know, drug centers and whatever, and not drug rehab, by my name. Right. Anyway, and so what they did was they, they renovated the old houses with the porches and they made them street friendly. Jane Jacobs talks about this. Street friendly. And it, it, they've, they've really um, renovated this neighborhood that was, that was pretty badly damaged in riots in the 60s. I mean, I lived there and you didn't go there mm -hmm. to, to Division Street. You did not go there. It wasn't safe to even drive hardly. And now it's, it's, it's a thriving neighborhood. And it's and just it's, when we're trying to do beauty in a public building, it's almost impossible to, to, to get there because no one agrees on what beauty is. And, and it ends up being kind of a material pursuit, and we end up with some really hideous... Uh, yeah, we do. There's that one in San Francisco, the Federal Building. It just it looks like a bunch of trash fell out of the sky. Yeah. I don't know. It's terrible. So how do, is there any, do you have any ideas for how to address you know, that whole problem of how do we get some agreement on what's beautiful when we're trying to do things in cities? And, and dealing with uh, public agencies, how do we get them to value beauty? If, I can, <laughs> if you knew that, yeah, I mean, if I knew really that, really, yeah, really I'd helpful. Be, I'd win the Nobel Prize. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a panacea for it, but I think one place to start is is to start with understanding that that buildings are more than function. And you know, well, there's the famous arts and crafts adage of William Morris: "Have nothing in your homes that you do not um, know to be useful and believe to be beautiful. Believe know to be useful and believe to be beautiful." So, so it, it isn't just form and function. And the worst of the Bauhaus was just that. I kind of think that there's good and bad in every style. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's brutalist stuff that's beautiful, and then there's brutal, brutalist stuff that is brutal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's ugly everything. You could, you know, we could go on and on um, about, about how anything, you know, it depends. There's like Baroque. I used to think I hated Baroque until I spent time in southern Germany. And it's beautiful. But then you drive around, then you go into some church that was built later, and they were ugly as all get out, and it was still Baroque. It was like, yeah, this guy, something happened here. They lost the plot, you know. That's, so that's all possible. It's, it's about balance, I think. And, and I think that, that just to start off, in, instead of just looking at the function, you have to look at 
at, at the meaning and of something beyond in the human spirit that has to be spoken to. And also about the human scale, which is the importance of the pattern language books. He made that point over and over. Where, what are places people like to be in? They're places with human scale. And even if you do the grand skyscraper, you know, it, you can make it accessible on the ground floor in some way that brings people in. I mean, you know, we were just in New York City over Christmas, and I love it, but some neighborhoods are more fun than others. And if they took out all those brownstones, New York wouldn't be New York. Oh, I love the brownstones. You need those, yeah. and if you walk up Madison, you walk, anyway, you know, and it is a mix, and they've had, you know, bloody fights in New York City. I mean, the most famous being Robert Moses and the freeway he didn't get to build. Mm -hmm. um, and. And, and, and then they turned the, high, the, the old um, elevated railroad into the High Line. And that's another example of taking something that could become an eyesore, that could become a, a, you know, a, a, a place of drug users and whatever, and turning it into something beautiful. Uh, one, one last question here. I mean, we're, we're here in your offices in Orange County. And, you know, from the outside, it's a nice but fairly ordinary uh, yeah. Irvine office building, you know, very nice. Uh, but you've, inside, you've filled the place with uh, beautiful artwork. One piece is, is the backdrop. And, uh, and, and I know you touched on it a little bit before, but um, how, how has it affected the, uh, the work environment? And, and what do you think about when you pick out pieces? Well, I... Well, it goes back to everything that I've said so far is, is you know, where, where you go to work, um, what the building says to you, says something about the work that you do and about how much your work is valued. So you go into the place I used to work when I worked at a newspaper that was a whole. Um, I was motivated by the work, but the place, you just had to do, get used to it. The cubicles, I've been there. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I worked there when there were no cubicles. Oh. There were no cubicles at all. It was desk next to desk, which I think was better than the cubicles, if you want my opinion. But anyway, and it had a gritty kind of feel to it, kind of front pagey. I mean, it was just desks, and you were right next to the person next to you, and you're on your, you know, I'm old enough. I had a telephone, it was a landline. And, and I had a big, and a big old hunking computer that I worked on. Um, and the person next to me had one, like from here to there, and the person there and there and there, um, and it 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 wasn't beautiful. And my motivation was uh, how important I thought the work what, that I was that I did was. But it makes in like our office isn't doesn't have that in the sense that you you know when you work in a newspaper and you're an editor or a reporter, you see your work every morning, and there's something wonderful about that. That rewards you, but the kind of work we do here, it's long term, and some people are accountants, and you know they don't wake up in the morning and see their beautiful spreadsheet. I don't know, maybe that gets people happy. It makes some people happy. The place says that whoever owns this place and whoever we're working for, who do work in the arts and who care about housing, well, they cared about the arts and the housing for us too. Mm -hmm it would be kind of an empty thing if we didn't care about where the people work and we say we care about others. You know, it's like in Chaucer, the, the, the woman, I think it's the nun's priest tale. Uh, there's a woman, I don't know if it's in that one, but there's this woman who has these two dogs and she talks all the time about people, but she, she treats the dogs better than she treats the people, which is Chaucer's point. You know, we care about the world and art, and, but we don't do that in our office. Ooh, that's, that's, a, that's hypocrisy. And, and, and I didn't do it because I thought about that. I did it because it's where I'd want to be, you know. I'd want to be in a place. And that's, it's, you know, this place is, and this is, gets to orthodoxy in a way, because in orthodoxy, the idea is that you are in beauty when you're in the church. Right. You, are, you aren't an observer, you're a participant. Right. And, and that should be the way it is when you come to work here, that you're in it. You aren't just a participant creating it for someone else. It matters for you, too. Yeah, and liturgy means work of the people. Yes, yeah. and you participate, and you are in 
you are in beauty and so people should work in it too if that's what we think we're all about and, and how do you pick the pieces what what is, is it just I don't know, is there a, a guideline or a... I've been looking at art since I was 12 years old. I go to a lot of art galleries, I go to a lot of art museums, and I guess, I mean, when people ask me, how do I learn to discern art, I say, you got to do a lot of looking. Mm -hmm. And it's about, it's about the balance, it's about the visual. If it hold, you know, it's like a piece of a poem. When you read it, if it holds together, visual. the same... Um, is it, a is it pleasing visually, first of all? Right. Um, and, and does it work? I mean, some things people think um, are, are beautiful. It's, it's other people wouldn't like a lot of art like made out of cardboard or something. But that can be beautiful, too. It all depends on how it's put together. Mm -hmm.